and we have to really escalate the noise we make so that we'll be heard. Welcome to Gay USA. I'm Andy Hum. I'm Rachel Lipstein. Rachel, introduce the audience to yourself. Well, thank you for having me, Andy. It's sure. a pleasure to be on the program. I'm filling in for Ann Northrup. Uh, uh, I'm a writer and uh, a copy editor at The New Yorker magazine, and I perform around the city occasionally. And it's a joy to be here commenting on the news and culture pertaining to we we'll have to get USA. more about your. We have to keep us posted about your performances. Let's go to the headlines this week. Uh, good. We had elections this Tuesday, primaries, in three states, and the the Vermont Democrats, in a first, nominated transgender Christine Holquist for governor. Uh, we will bring you that on all of the election results. And in other news, Trump's Department of Labor uh, greenlights anti-LGBT discrimination by federal contractors. So the OFCCP. Um, is amid scrutiny right now. Terrible. Uh, Missouri Republicans nominated uh, another anti-LGBT, anti-Semitic Hitler sympathizer for state office. And Illinois' Republican governor has vetoed an LGBT rights bill in expansion. Mm. Uh, get this, at NYU, a lesbian professor uh, was suspended for sexually harassing a gay male graduate student. It's an incredible um, story that we can't wait to talk about. Um, in Oklahoma, parents uh, are, have threatened violently on Facebook a transgender seventh grader, and the opening of the school has been delayed due to safety concerns. Really heartbreaking story. A lesbian teacher in Indiana was disciplined by a Catholic school for marrying her partner. And Richard Sipe, who warned the Catholic Church of abuse scandals for decades and was ignored, um, memorably played by Richard Jenkinson, uh, Spotlight uh, has died. Yes, he has. And, and, and the same week as that big Pennsylvania scandal was uncovered, although it's not that big news because it's been going on forever. So in the elections, uh, Christine Holquist is the first uh, out transgender nominee of a major party for a governorship. And this is in Vermont. She's 62 years old. Um, she joins other LGBTQ uh, gubernatorial candidates this year. There she is, Kate Brown in Oregon, uh, Jared Polis in Colorado, and Lupe Valdez in Texas, all Democrats. Now, she has to face this Republican incumbent, Governor Phil Scott, mm -hmm. who was fairly popular. She, she got, though, half the vote, almost half the vote in a big race. Their nearest opponent only got 22.5%. Uh, she was the CEO of the Vermont Electric Cooperative, and, um, which is a power utility, uh, which she saved from um, Apparent, bankruptcy. Yeah, yeah. default, um, which, uh, you know, our first uh, potentially transgender governor being the CEO of, uh, uh, or chief executive of a corporation. Well, she transitioned Maybe. while she was there Right, in and, the, and the first apparently, uh, uh, transgender uh, senior executive of a large corporation as well. Really? Um, so, um, leaning in. Um, in other news, the Department of Labor um, has issued a directive uh, giving OFCCP uh, contractors license to exercise well, religious explain freedom. explain what that is. What, what is it? The Office of what? So it's the Office of uh, Federal Contract Compliance Programs. Yes. That is the um, body uh, sort of issue uh, delegated to make sure that contractors are complying with not just anti-discrimination protections uh, issued on the federal level but um, affirmative action uh, initiatives as well distinguished from the EEOC of course that monitors um, non-federal contractor employees uh, nationwide which the Republicans tried to merge um, in the budget right so the, what they're know. saying to these contractors is you know if you have religious if, 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 if a contractor has religious concerns about who they're hiring and how they're providing services uh, you, you know you're going to be given special consideration about this we're not um, rescinding Obama's executive order on LGBT rights uh, but they are really per doing se it in, although in practice. the most scandalous part of the story to me is that um, from their website 
conspicuously has disappeared the um, the guidance that clarifies that the religious freedom exemption does not uh, license discrimination. It only allows uh, right. contractors to prefer to hire someone of their own um, religion. But that um, that entire question has disappeared from the website. Right so. now, this is a this is this problem didn't start with the Trump administration. I mean, you know, in New York City, when you get a contract, you sign something that says, "I won't discriminate." But there are a lot of religious organizations that, you know, are, are good with Israel, Catholic Charities, all these places, which are very discriminatory in many respects uh, in the way they provide services. Yeah. And it's really gone too far. If you, if you get government money, you should abide by civil laws. Totally. I'm going to talk about I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's always been a fine line to tread. Uh, what's the difference between um, preferring to hire people of your own religion versus, you know, implicit discrimination? Uh, on the basis of gender identity, something like that, but it, but they're not even making a show of having it on the website anymore. So, it's right. um, it's re, it's re, it really feels like it is em emboldening. A yeah, crusade on the part of this administration, especially Jeff Sessions. If you're ever feeling soft on him because Trump hates him so much, <laughs> uh, you know he's yeah. the guy behind a lot of this stuff. At, well, at the Justice Department. Um, if you're ever feeling soft on Jeff Sessions, um, check in with your local health professional. Okay, let's 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 give let's give some of the other election results. That, that Tammy Baldwin was renominated uh, for the U.S. Senate, and she's leading in the polls by double digits over her uh, uh, potential opponents. And actually, who is she? Who is she? I have to look up who she's going to be facing at this point. Um, but uh, oh yeah, it's State Senator Leah Vukmir. Uh, that's who's going to be her Republican opponent for the Senate. The Cokes are throwing a ton of money up up at that. Also in Wisconsin, the anti-LGBT Milwaukee County Sheriff Richard Schmidt, who posted all these anti-gay things because mm. of his religion, uh, uh, he was defeated in the um, uh, Democratic primary. In Kansas, they've certified Chris Colback as the nominee for governor, very anti-gay, and yes. we're supposed to want him as the nominee because he's easier to beat yeah. than the Supposedly. incumbent governor. The Democrat there is Laura Kelly, a state senator. Scott Walker is going to be facing off with Tony Evers, who's sort of running on school funding. Um, in Minnesota, we have an out lesbian in the second congressional district, Angie Craig, uh, uh, who was going to oppose Representative Jason Lewis, who mm. has compared LGBTQ people to rapists. Um, thus far, there are 13 LGBTQ Democrats nominated for Congress in both houses, and that's only so far. Uh, in Wisconsin, out lesbian Margaret and Jabretson won the Democratic nomination for the 7th Congressional District to face Representative Sean Duffy. Uh, anything else we should bring up? I think we I mean, it's a, it's a tremendous number of, uh, it's uh, a pink wave, whatever the Times is calling it. Yeah. Um, uh, 13 uh, LGBTQ people for federal office in both houses um, of Congress. That's pretty remarkable to keep uh, track of, even if we can't in specific. And they're saying that uh, the St Times did a story, New York Times, did a story this week about how Republican women are almost afraid to run this year. Hmm. Uh, you know, that they're reluctant. To, they won't want to do it this year with, with Trump in there. Uh, and by, by the way, speaking of politics, we learned this week that the, that the CEO of Nathan's Hot Dogs and also the big real estate firm, Douglas Elliman in New York, well, the, one of the biggest, one of the three biggest, um, is having a fundraiser for Trump this Friday at his Southampton home. And I called both Nathan's and Douglas Elliman. They don't want to talk about this, but I but people are calling for boycotts of both companies. So check in with us before you purchase a Nathan's hot dog again. I like Nathan's hot dogs, but I we won't both eat them do. now. Yeah. Yeah, it's well, terrible. I'm vegetarian apparently. All right. Let's go on let's go on to some other political news. Mm -hmm. uh, Cynthia Nixon is finally going to have a debate with Andrew Cuomo. She's the, He's of course, out agreed. lesbian candidate. She's, uh, this will be on August 29th on WCBS uh, during, the, during your summer vacation, which is the way Andrew Cuomo wants it. Um, the primary is going to be on September 13th, and we commented last week they're doing it on a Thursday. It has to do with the Jewish holiday and the fact that they don't want to have it on September 11th, which uh, is a, a dark day in history. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Char Charlottesville, um, uh, coming up on the anniversary, there's uh, been anti-racism rallies um, in Washington, Charlottesville. Roberta Kaplan uh, took over the HRC Twitter to provide updates on the lawsuit against the white Yeah, we have, a, we have a picture there of what went on in Charlottesville, if you can pull that up, uh, of the people marching. A lot of young people. 
our side outnumbered the racists by uh, like a hundred to one uh, or more. I mean, they we you know they, were, they really couldn't pull it together to have these right wing rallies like they did last year. Yeah. And I, I like the fact that they're on the run. And uh, Roberta's suing them, isn't she? Yeah, she's representing ten plaintiffs um, uh, from that incident. Um, I I'm yeah I get c cautious to draw too much uh, encouragement from. The, the numbers, but it, at least they didn't show show up in, in the same forces. And the Republicans keep nominating uh, Nazi sympathizers. It, in this case, we've got a picture of this guy. They nominated for uh, a state House of Representatives in Missouri, a guy named Steve West from Clay, Clay County. He gave an interview last year saying Hitler was right about what was going on in Germany and uh, uh, and who was and who was behind it? He identified who was behind it as Jewish cabals. Uh, he also made yeah. anti-LGBT statements. He says he was taken out of context. He says Jews can be beautiful people, yeah. but they're a remnant of a tribe that rejected Christ. Oh, I see. Uh, he's Islamophobic, naturally. Missouri Republicans have declared him vile, but he's your candidate. He's up against Democratic incumbent John Carpenter. Uh, if you're a Nazi, you can also vote for Arthur Jones for Congress in the 3rd Congressional District of Illinois, where the party uh, also withdrew support. Now, they withdraw, su they withdraw support for these candidates, but not for Trump. That's right. Um, and he said some bad things this week, too. He certainly has. Um, Clarksdale, Mississippi passed uh, an LGBT rights law. Um, the city of Clarksdale joining Jackson and Magnolia as the third Mississippi state uh, with non-discrimination protection. Yeah, Mississippi. The, uh, we do well in the cities, and Jackson is the capital, and they've done it, and uh, that's terrific. Uh, by the way, in Pennsylvania, we told you about that commission that they've got for LGBT, uh, the governor's commission, Governor Wolf. And they were touting it as the first gubernatorial commission, but it was done back in 1975 by Governor Milton Schapp, so uh, it's not the first. Alan LePayover brought this to our attention. He was an assistant to the chair of that commission at the time. Okay, uh, some more Trump stuff. A couple of notes. Uh, I'm kind of encouraged that the FCC killed the Sinclair Tribune merger deal. Sinclair Broadcasting being this very big uh, conservative uh, television thing, they stopped that. But they also uh, approved for the first time 100% foreign ownership of four radio stations in Alaska and Texas by two Australians. That's not good news. No. Uh, and in Illinois, the governor uh, has vetoed a bill that would have expanded the state's non-discrimination law uh, to cover even the smallest businesses. So uh, up until that point, it was covering uh, businesses of 15 employees or more were obligated to comply. It would have proposed to expand that to a business of any size, and he has vetoed it under um, business sense type. Yeah, I, I've never heard of exemptions for small businesses from human rights laws. Uh, if you in housing, two family homes are generally exempt from human rights laws. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you have one other apartment in your house or you want to rent out an apartment in your house, they, you can rent to whoever you want. That's pretty much across the board. Well, so, so but under not bigger Title Seven um, of the Civil Rights Law and other. Uh, federal non-discrimination statutes that um, the EEOC is charged with applying, they define a business as 15 employees or greater. Um, it was a progressive push on the part of, uh, uh, of Illinois advocates to expand that to, to, you know, businesses of any size, if you have four employees, and especially if you're, in a, if you're working for a place that, you know, a gelato shop with three employees and one manager, and you're discriminated against, you know, you can't go to HR, so in some ways right. the, those protections are even more essential that uh, the governor has uh, vetoed saying that, you know, this, this uh, threshold was, is sort of... Well, well he's tried to out. position himself as fairly pro-gay, right. Governor Rauner, mm -hmm. but, uh, and he's up against a, a formidable Democratic opponent, and um, now he's saying, I'm not going to go with you on this one, so... Yeah. Let's, let's talk about that terrible story out of Achille, am I saying it right? <laughs> it's, pronounced, Oklahoma? it's pronounced Ashley, which I think is Ashley. funny. Ashley, because it sounded like, I L L E. Yeah, everyone was saying actually in the videos, but um, it's Ashley. Um, All right, this is in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, and a, a seventh grader is transgender, a transgender girl, and a, a parent 
heard about the fact that this kid was at the school and posted something on Facebook, something terrible. Yeah, they, she had uh, used the uh, girls' bathroom and uh, parents, she'd been using the staff bathroom. Before that, she w went to a new school. They hadn't apparently found out where the staff bath bathroom was. The parents on Facebook said, uh, quote, you know we have open hunting seasons on them kind, ain't no bag limit in them neither. Uh, also um, said a good sharp knife will do the job real quick and make you a real girl. Why don't we run the local news report on this and uh, you'll learn more about it. Well, several law enforcement agencies have now stepped in after parents made threats to harm a 12-year-old, actually ISD student, on social media last week. News 12's Kristen Weaver spoke with the girl's mother about what they're doing to move forward. Ashley schools just reopened their middle school here on Wednesday. It was the seventh graders first day of school. That's when these parents started making threats all over social media. She's been living as, as female for years and so she started actually living as Maddie, you know, and so, and we had no problems when we first started. 12-year-old Ashley ISD transgender student Maddie's mother, Brandy Rose, says her family moved to Bryan County from Sherman when Maddie was in fifth grade. Trouble started when Maddie was accused by another student of peeping under a bathroom stall. My daughter leans very far forward to use the bathroom, and so I can, I can understand why someone might see her leaning forward as, oh my gosh, she's trying to look under the stall. Maddie didn't get in trouble, but started using the staff bathroom and had been doing that for two years. That is, until the first day of school Wednesday in the new building. Before she was able to be told where the staff bathroom was, she had to pee and she used the girl's bathroom one single time. One parent found out and took to a private Ashley Facebook group to complain. That's where the threat started. Adults called Maddie by it and thing. Some said she should be stabbed or beat up. One even suggested it was open hunting season for transgender people. Um, that's scary, and these are adults making threats to a child. I mean, I just, I don't understand it. Rose tells us her usually upbeat and positive daughter is afraid for her life. She's just an awesome kid, and to see, to see any kind of fear in her like that, because other people, and especially adults, just, it, I can't explain how bad that hurts me. The sheriff's office says the investigation is still ongoing, but they're taking everything very seriously. Ashley ISD should reopen its doors on Wednesday. Reporting in Ashley, Kristen Weaver, News 12. And we talked to the superintendent today about the decision to close the school. As a precaution, the Bryan County Sheriff suggested closing the campus Monday and Tuesday. Superintendent Rick Bean agreed. He says there haven't been any problems with the Maddie, the transgender child, over the past two years until the adults made comments last week. Bean says that he and the school can't control what parents post online. Ashley School believes that everyone should receive a free and safe education. Uh, we have a very talented staff that cares about all of our kids. Uh, they take every student as a very special human being with us. And the sheriff says that the mother filed a protective order against one of those parents that made the comments online. No arrests have been made. However, special several agencies, including the FBI, are now investigating to see if any comments constitute a hate crime. Indeed. And uh, Mr. Bean, that superintendent, also said, um, I need education. We all need to be educated, um, which I think in uh, such a terrible story is, is kind of a note of. Yes, for, for, I mean, yeah. yes, I mean, uh, you know, uh, local groups like PFLAG and other groups have offered to help with educating everybody about this, but all schools need to do this. You know, that's what Ann and I used to do for a living at the Hendrick Martin Institute. Mm. Go into schools, talk to kids, but talk to staff about, because they just are afraid of talking about LGBT issues at all. Yeah. And, and so everyone needs competency training for the first time, whether it's coming from your, your friend group or from your uh, media consumption or from literal workshops in your workplace. Um, so openness to that, I think, is, yeah. is what's going to You need permission, and it helps when it comes from the top, to uh, talk about yeah. it. And people are just afraid to. So that's great. Mm. Uh, and apparently it, it, it turned out that it maybe is only one parent from the school district who said something, and then other people from around the country started chiming in on the, on the Facebook page. But what a heart wring. This is a seventh grader. Yeah. And they're trying to turn her into a freak and into an object of violence. And in other um, really discouraging uh, news, uh, 
nationally, ProPublica released a report on um, misgendering uh, of trans murder victims, or dead naming, as it's called. Um, Wyvern Cox, in a statement, um, gave a very moving uh, Instagram and Twitter post saying, being misgendered and dead named in my death as she was contemplating um, suicide at a certain point of her life, felt like it would be the ultimate insult to the psychological and emotional injuries I was experiencing daily as a black trans woman in New York City, the injuries that made me want to take my own life. Um, so, I, you know, the fact that this is getting uh, attention and that these, these statistics are coming out um, should, well, should we, highlight we talk issue. about these uh, transgender murders of transgender women, mostly women of color, every week. Mm -hmm. But we're we're apparently only talking about the tip of the iceberg because so many are right. misgendered. Right. I mean, this ProPublica study looked at since tw 65 agencies investigating murders of transgender misgendered them in 74 authorities misgendered them in 74 out of 85 cases. Uh, now, they did say that arrests have been made in 55% of the cases, which may not sound like much, but apparently uh, the overall rate for arresting someone in murder is 59% overall. But anyway, uh, in Detroit, uh, there was a trans woman named Kimora uh, Stubal, and uh, uh, she, was, she survived harassment. This guy came up to her and was harassing her, and then he pulls the gun out. Mm -hmm. So she grabs the gun, and it goes off, and it, and it hits her. And his defense is, uh, and she got shot in the shoulder. Uh, his lawyer says, oh, he didn't intend to sh shoot. Uh, the prosecution says it was a hate crime, but LGBT people are not covered in Detroit. Uh, or Michigan, mm -hmm. so they're calling it ethnic intimidation and gender on the basis of gender. They're making it a hate crime, but wow, right. it so is tough th out there. Completely. Um, Clark County, Nevada adopted policy to protect trans students uh, on the other side of things, um, following the, the passage of Nevada's anti-bullying state law, which requires schools to create policy to address the needs of um, gender diverse students. Yeah, we get a lot of good policies, a lot of good policies in New York, but you know, I'm, I'm going to a conference in a couple of weeks in New York about mm -hmm. bullying, even though we've had an anti-bullying law and civil rights protections for a long time. You have to really do a lot of work in the schools in order to get this under control. Yeah, and it's a divisive issue in Nevada. They've been trying to, yeah. it looks like, get this thing through despite raucous public forums really? uh, for the past, yeah, several months. Um, so the parents, parents get up in arms. It passed Four to three. It passed, yeah, in a split decision um, in ruling that students may, they have three options, use the locker room or restroom consistent with their gender identity, use the room correspondent to their sex assigned at birth, or come up with another individual plan. That also applies to uh, students who go on overnight field trips, which in my experience is a, a hellish prospect, yes. even <laughs> under the most cisgendered of circumstances. Yes. So. Um, uh, uh, nice to see what LeBron James did this week. Of course, he's under attack from President Trump, but he featured the stars of the television series Pose about transgender life, uh, house life in the 80s uh, on a list of women his daughter looks up to. That was nice. It's really sweet. Uh, and, and also in Indiana, a federal judge ordered Evansville School District to allow trans, a, a trans student who's 17 to use the men's room. This guy had to sue over being forced to use the women's room or the nurse's office room. So here's someone who presents as, as a man, uh, as a boy, and he's forced to go to the girls' room uh, in their school, but not now under this federal order. Right. Um, in other news, we um, note the passing of Richard Seip. Um, oh, yes. Am I saying that right, Seip? Sorry? I'm saying that right, Richard, Richard Seip. Richard Seip. Yeah, yeah. talk to him. Yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, his uh, influential conclusion, he, he uh, studied and wrote about um, sexual abuse in the Catholic Church for um, many years. Pretty much the foremost expert, a former priest who right. ended up marrying a former nun, which often happens. Yeah, I, from what I understand, he um, went into the church, you know, with uh, idealism and was so scandalized by all of the... The, the rampant cover-ups and the sexual abuse that he found that he developed a passion for this. Um, his conclusion was that the, the two phenomena are uh, linked uh, of celibacy, which requires, um, which is so often broken that 
it creates a culture of duplicity and cover-up and secrecy, which then enables a culture of child sexual sexual. Abuse. And as he pointed out, including by the bishops and cardinals themselves, so they have this secret, so they're not about to investigate it for others. I mean, I was told many years ago that when whenever there was a bishops meeting, half of them had their boyfriends with them. Mm -hmm. You know, and now and of course a lot of a lot of the stuff that's uncovered is it's not all it's not all you know male on male. Some of it, much of it, is on girls yeah. as well. But he ultimately concluded that about 6% of Catholic priests abuse children and that about half the priests were sexually active. And he, he gave this to the bish bishops in 1986 and they just ignored it. Yeah. Uh, they put it aside. Uh, and this comes on the heels, obviously, of um, this enormous grand jury report that's come out um, from Pennsylvania, uh, reporting that thousands uh, of children have been uh, abused over the. Well, past they documented decades. a thousand over, yeah. over the last seventy years, and about three hundred priests being involved in it, and the complicity of the police in it. Uh, but of course, that's just the tip of the iceberg. These are just the ones who have come forward. Right. Um, and there's a push in the wake of that um, report to change the statute of limitation laws, which has long been a demand of advocates for well, victims. Well, they've demanded it in New York and they can't get it mm -hmm. because the Republican Senate in New York uh, stops it. So, folks, if you get a Democratic Senate in the uh, New York State, you might be able to pass that bill. But going back to this report, which is horrifying, uh, one priest raped a girl in a hospital after she had her tonsils out. Another got a 17-year-old pregnant and allowed, was allowed to stay in ministry after faking a marriage certificate and then divorcing her. Um, and it's, they say it's unlikely that criminal charges are gonna be brought as a result of this because mm. the statute of limitations is, uh, is up on them. Uh, this was a big grand jury report. It should be done in every state and should, it should all be rooted out. And there's a lot yeah. of criticism of uh, you know, Pope Francis for not you know, disciplining the bishops over this which he's reluctant to do. Uh, the only one they've gone after, he, the only one they've gone after is this guy, Ted McCarrick, who was the, the, the Cardinal of Washington mm -hmm. uh, recently. You read about that. But Sipe warned about McCarrick in 2009. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we should do that Franklin, Indiana story at Roncalli High School. Uh, yes. Now, do you know who Roncalli is? That was the that was the name that was the real name of Pope John the Twenty Third who died in the early sixties. Anyway, it's a Catholic high school. This woman was a guidance counselor, Shelley Fitzgerald, and she married a woman in twenty fourteen, and she's been at the school for fifteen years. They just found out she was married to a woman, so she was put on paid administrative leave. They, uh, they say the staff must follow the teachings of the Catholic Church, and she was offered a choice between resign. Or divorce that woman. <laughs> well, now Can the Catholics imagine? believe in divorce when it comes to this. Uh, Indiana law has a ministerial exception to the human rights law, as many places do. And the question is, mm -hmm. is if she's a guidance counselor and she's not doing religious counseling, is she covered by the ministerial exception? Right. Open question. And, and many students are supporting her. Yeah. A student has said apparently that um, the uh, Roncalli rebels... Uh, are not to blame, but the, in fact, the archdiocese. Is of that the name of their? Is that their? Is that their name? That the Roncalli rebels. The Roncalli rebels, and if they are rebelling against anything, it's not the homophobic doctrines of the Catholic Church. Um, but we'll see how that plays out. We will. It's um, happening everywhere. In uh, another headline from earlier, uh, we have a, a lesbian NYU professor. Oh, this story. All yeah. right, folks. Who's been Fasten your seatbelts. Go ahead. It's true. It's it's a, it's a tough one. Um, she has been suspended uh, for sexual harassment. Well, let's put harassment. her picture up. Her name is Anita Ronell. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, and um, uh, Avital Ronell looks like she's Israeli. I'm sorry, Avital. Um, Avital. Right. I, at first, I thought it was the same name uh, as uh, Rachel Weiss in Disobedience, but it is in fact <laughs> not. Um, she is uh, at NYU. She's a star philosopher, essentially. There aren't right. too many of them, and she's one of them. Um, found guilty by an 11 month Title IX investigation of sexual um, harassment, but not of assault, stalking, and retaliation, which she was also accused of. Okay, um, so, so the student who complained, we'll put his picture up. His name is, is it's Nimrod Reitman. Is that it? Is that right? Yes, Nimrod Reitman. And he complained for several years uh, that, uh, that she, he received dozens of emails from her referring to him as my most adored one, my sweet cuddly baby, my cock or spaniel, spelled that way, 
my astounding and beautiful Nimrod, and that she touched him repeatedly and slept in his bed. Now, all right, some, uh, she denies it, of course, uh, although she has been suspended for a year after an investigation. Some feminist scholars defended her and called him malicious. Uh, he's now married to a man. Uh, uh, He's posted at Harvard. Um, they're also the critics are also complaining. I mean, what's resonant about this case is that the um, the defense from the feminist, largely feminist, uh, intellectual academia critics uh, or supporters of um, Renell are saying uh, their defenses echo in many ways the what uh, defenders of. Uh, Men. Men accused in the <laughs> Me Too movement um, said so. He didn't come forward until two years after he left uh, NYU. They're saying, why did you wait so long? Um, they, uh, you know, they, they're saying he wants attention. Her response, which I, I may take the liberty to, to, sure, to read, course. our communications, this is, this is um, Rennell's defense, our communications, which um, Reitman now claims constituted sexual harassment were between two adults, a gay man and a queer woman, who share an Israeli heritage as well as a penchant for florid and campy communications arising from our common academic background. All right, but he said one of his first encounters with her was he was told to meet her in Paris and he ended up at her place and, you know, and she said, oh, sleep in my bed and, you know, and he said, look, you're my professor, don't do this. Now that's his story. And that's her story, but there was an investigation. Uh, I've also, you know, I heard from one of our viewers, Carla J, a very prominent professor and and uh, lesbian academic. She says, you know, she, you know, her, the tendency, her tendency too, is to believe the accusers. Uh, but um, she thinks that when it when a woman is 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 found guilty of it, there's a lot more attention to it than mm. there is when there are men who do this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's always important to look at the how. Uh, the you know disproportionate kind of uh, ways these cases are handled, even as we look at the just sort of um, amazing details of the case. Yes, um, it is quite a story. It was it was it was on the front page of the New York Times. All right, um, in or in Orlando, uh, several gay and lesbian people were hit by paintballs on July 27th. We're just learning about this at Lake Eola Park. And at the local gay bar, the, at the, the Savoy Orlando, mm. cars with HR human rights campaign stickers on them were hit with paintballs. So the, and this is the city of the Pulse Massacre, so it's obviously got people nervous. And police are investigating it as a possible hate crime. That's right. Um, a, a new study finds that uh, Latino millennials are most likely, uh, of any millennials, to identify as LGBTQ. Um, the Gen Forward Survey Project at the University of Chicago reports that 22% of Latino young people identify as queer or trans, almost twice as many as any other demographic they looked at, um, which was almost, which was 1,900 people between 18 and 34. I wonder why that is. We will have to get a Latinx expert in to talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, study on, from UCLA on conversion therapy found that almost 700,000 have undergone some form of it in the United States. But they can't possibly be counting all the people who go grow up in these anti-gay religions where no. you're browbeaten into uh, heterosexuality if they can. Fourteen states have banned that for minors, and New York City and other jurisdictions classify it as consumer fraud, so you can't do it with adults either. Stop it. Okay. Um, the Mormon Church... Um, what did they do now? <laughs> well, they did something very quietly, but I, I found it interesting. Um, they released an updated handbook um, called Preach My Gospel, um, a sequel, a follow-up to Call Me By Your Name, maybe, um, which goes to every missionary around the world, um, 70,000 Mormons. Um, and in this new updated handbook, it codifies what's called their November policy, um, which came out in 2015 um, in the wake of o Obergefell making it very clear that um, children of same-sex parents and households could not um, have standing in the Mormon church no. until they were outside of... Yeah, until That's not they, very nice. It's, it's a tough one. It's a hard line stands. Um, and a student at BHU, an openly gay Mormon, said at the time of the policy, if you want to be gay and Mormon, okay, but you have to be Mormon. And you can't really be gay. Well, so. I would say it's time to there leave. There it is, yeah. I've turned in my card from the Catholic Church, uh, I guess, uh, maybe, well, I can't even remember the year. It was uh, a long time ago. Uh, in Atlanta, a landscaper... Uh, uh, denied service to a same-sex married couple. This guy, his name is Stuart Dureno of uh, 
Botanica Atlanta Landscape Design, mm. called their marriage a delusion. But, you know, there's a law against discrimination in Atlanta for LGBT people, so I wonder if they will take him up on that. Uh, another study about U.S. hospitals. One in six hospitals is now Catholic. In the, in the United States, one yeah. in, because there's all this consolidation going on, and mm. they glom onto them and they get them. And in some states, 30% of the care is from Catholic hospitals. And you know they have all these policies that we don't do certain things, especially women's reproductive stuff. Now, we know that they're not, not gonna do abortions, but they also won't do tubal ligations, and uh, they are not good to transgender people in, in, in terms of service. Uh, and many even discourage abortion referrals. So this is a huge problem in the United States. Um, okay. Moving into international news. Shall we? Yes, I'd let's say, do that. Let's do it. Um, a, we've got a, a picture of this. A 16-year-old in Russia um, was convicted under a gay propaganda law. Um, the Russian LGBT network who provided his lawyer said that authorities may have pursued charges following the teenager's involvement in, event, in an event called Gays or Putin. Well, his name is Maxim Nevorov, and he's quite a hero. Put his picture back up there. This kid is something. Um, they accused him of posting nude pictures of, of men on a, por uh, on a social network uh, porn site. He said he posted pictures of men hugging each other and things like that. Mm. Uh, and, and he vows to go on uh, with his activism. He was fined $738, which is apparently like more than a month's wages or something in some of these places. And he says he's, 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 he submitted 12 applications for public events, including one to make Putin a saint. He did that as a joke, but, they, but they're not taking it that way. Uh, it's, uh, you know, so he's got lawyers from the uh, Russia LGBT network, and he's being uh, persecuted for organizing these kinds of events. So um, good on you, Maxim Nevorov. Uh, he says, the police don't scare me. Anyway, if he doesn't pay the fine, by the way, he gets a uh, he gets a fourteen uh, day sentence. Yeah. All right. Which you don't want to do in a Russian prison, in in the midst of you know this the terrible crackdown and hunger strikes taking place. Um, right. There already. Um, okay. Other international news. In uh, Australia, the New South Wales uh, police commissioner apologized publicly for past police department brutality. Um, it, this is on the fortieth anniversary of their nineteen seventy eight. Um, the first gay Mardi Gras where uh, revelers, protesters, uh, were brutally attacked by the police. They call themselves the 78ers. Uh, and in, in this case, the... Um, and they threw 178 people into jail and violently, violently assaulted them. Uh, I had never heard of this incident. Yeah. Sorry, Australia. I hadn't heard of it before. It's hor horrifying. Well, and it's funny you say that. I mean, Australia has a pretty... Uh, in, intense history of uh, saying I'm sorry they have an I'm sorry day um, and it seems like their um, approach to culpability and public accountability is um, this is not the first time that a police uh, affiliate has apologized for um, the 78 incident in, in 2016 they had a, an LGBTI spokesman um, who was who was a representative who also apologized to everyone and both of them gave really eloquent and completely accountability um, taking, I mean, really eloquent, a bit well, of a stretch. One of, our, but one of our demands is in New York is getting an apology from the police department, yeah. at least for the Stonewall yeah. uh, assault on the Stonewall. But I mean, the history of arresting gay people and trapping gay men, some of which still goes on in many places, but also in New York. And you know, there's never really been a movement in, in this country for uh, not only apologies, but reparations for all the sodomy convictions. There are men my age who were arrested for sodomy, uh, who had their lives ruined over it. Yeah. So yeah, uh, it's so anyway. Good, good on you in Australia mm. for making that happen. Um, Turkey uh, has announced that they will not once again participate in Eurovision over um, the presence of gay and trans performers. Eurovision, if you're anti-gay and trans, you're just not going to enjoy it. Um, Turkey seems to be retreating more and more from Europe. I mean, they're part of the you know uh, the union, and uh, they are they're they're kowtowing to their re re religious conservatives at this point. Yeah, I mean, for LGBT rights in Turkey, it's, it's looking, certainly they're trying to hide it more. Um, they, they banned Pride in 2015, and then the film festival um, in Ankara and, uh, was erased, and, uh, and now Eurovision. So, um, 
Uh, We're hoping they rejoin the party okay. soon. Now, Cuba, the, we keep telling you that they're putting forth marriage equality. It's apparently going to a referendum now on February 24th after clearing the National Assembly. But some of the dis Cuban dissidents who have been fighting the Cuban government for years over its repression, and of course they were very repressive on gay stuff, not that we weren't, uh, but they are call they're basically calling this like pinkwashing. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're trying to show the world that they're more liberal by doing this gay thing, but they're still locking up people who protest the government, et cetera. So we will see how that progresses. Um, in Malaysia, uh, two women are sentenced to public caning for having sex with one another. Um, gay sex is banned in the country, uh, which groups it together with bestiality and a list of offenses which are against the order of nature. Horrible. And they were also, beyond being caned, were fined $800. And if they fail to pay their fine, they go to prison for four months. And $800 is a lot of money there. Yeah. All right. In British, this is one of my favorite stories of the week. In British Columbia, a Christian university, Trinity Western, they voted to dr drop their covenant with their students uh, that forbids sex outside of marriage. All right. Mm -hmm. Because, and why did they do this? Because they want to accredit their law school, and there are these law societies that say, if you're going to treat people this way, we're not going to certify you. Uh, we're not going to accredit you. So, and th they're building it off a Supreme Court of Canada decision in June that said a per requiring a person to behave contrary to their sexual identity is degrading and disrespectful. And so the law societies have the right to deny accreditation in these cases. So the school's still going to make it a, a, a voluntary covenant mm -hmm. of that students, but they don't have to do it. So LGBT advocates are, are not totally satisfied because they say that creates still a, a, t a policy a of intolerance. Yeah. But can you imagine if a case like this got to the Supreme Court of the United States at this point from a religious school? I mean, I, I, you know, at this point, I don't, I don't think we would win. But it's sometimes helpful to have LGBT rights weighed in the balance with um, the desire to have the law school tuitions as part yes. of your underline. Yes. Um, and to get your, the people who graduate from your school, you know, become lawyers in these various jurisdictions. That's why they do it. Mm -hmm. um, another note in Australia, at risk of putting too positive a spin on things uh, to the expense of others, uh, an Australian senator, uh, Fraser Anning, called for a white ethno state and a... Um, a separate term, white ethno state in, within Australia? He, he's or he wants the whole country to be a white ethno uh, state? Uh, yeah. He's like, just, like Trump wants... Here. Yeah, he's he's a, a Trumpist and called for a final solution, oh. um, which in, in his case is a popular vote, but um, a voted choice a of words. Final words. solution? Did he know of what he speaks? Well, if he didn't know, it was quickly pointed out to him. Um, and in Japan, Robert Campbell, a TV celebrity and scholar of Japanese literature, publicly came out to. Um, He's been, you know, gay for ages. He's not a, a young man, uh, but yeah, he's been with his partner for 20 years, and he's just coming out. And and for for noble reason, I mean. Yeah, and he married the guy mm -hmm. in um, the United States. In response to a string of um, anti-LGBT comments that um, Japanese lawmakers have been making. Well, yeah, it's weird. These are like lower-level legislators in yeah. Japan who are making these. And what what did they say that was so anti-gay? Gay people are. Unproductive. <laughs> <laughs> that was the insult to us. Laugh. And this has gotten people out in the streets in Japan, and it's got this guy to come out of the closet after uh, all these years, yeah. which is terrific. I mean, and, uh, and it goes back to what we were talking about with the school and, and not being able to talk about these issues. Now Japan is talking about these issues because, the, I mean, they didn't talk about it at all. They were so reticent about talking about homosexuality. Mm. Now, because we're being attacked, People are coming out and uh, responding, which is uh, very encouraging to see. Uh, we have um, a new commissioner for hum a new high commissioner for human rights at the yeah. UN, um, Michelle Bachelet. Yeah, we uh, got a picture of her, don't we? We with, do. We have a picture of her with the um, you, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Guterres, accepting her um, her new post. She's served as the president of Chile 
um, between 2006 and 2010, and then again 2014 and 2018. They've had a, an interesting handoff of administrations between the same um, conservative president uh, who, with whom she exchanged the title. And she uh, she's got a really interesting history. She's been very pro um, LGBT. She um, she pushed through. Um, a gay marriage bill. Uh, she introduced a gay marriage bill in 2017 with no hopes of getting it passed necessarily, but made the gesture. She did, as a big accomplishment, um, get the abortion um, exceptions bill passed. Yes, and she, obviously and she was the first woman president and, and of course a big advocate of women's rights. She had worked as a pediatrician and as a public health advocate, but in the Pinochet regime, which was the fascist regime that the United States installed there, when, uh, when they wanted to get rid of Allende under Kissinger and Nixon, uh, her father was imprisoned and tortured, and she and her mother were imprisoned and tortured in Chile. Yeah. And, of course, she became their president. And so she sounds like a terrific choice for the, for the Human Rights Post. The guy going out, and I apologize for not remembering his name, you know, said a lot of things that rubbed the, uh, the Trump administration the wrong way. But he says, if you have this job, you have got to speak out. Uh, about about these things, otherwise you you might as well get rid of the position. Yeah, totally. Um, in AIDS news. Uh, well, we we're not. We've got a couple more international things, if you don't please, mind. Uh, in Italy, the deputy prime minister, the deputy prime minister Matteo Salvini, of this, and he's from the far right Northern League party, an anti-immigrant party. He called same-sex parents unnatural. He called surrogacy a horror. He's the Ministry of the Interior. The first thing he did when he came in was they have these electronic ID cards that say parent one and parent two. He immediately changed it to mother and father. He is a piece of work and he's got a lot of power there in Italy. I worry about them. And in Poland, the defense minister called the LGBTQ pride event a parade of sodomites. His name is Marius Blazczak and he went after the 5,000 people who marched in a city called Poznan uh, and he's upset about Poznan because they have a local government that opposes the increasingly fascist regime in uh, uh, Poland. Uh, I'm really scared about what's happening in Europe, you know? I mean, you know, I, I, growing up, you heard about the Nazis and you heard about how horrible things, and you know how well Germany turned out afterwards, and then you see everything just drifting back, and it's really frightening. All right, uh, is that it for international news? It may be. That's what oh, well, I they're going to have the. Uh, the Catholic World Meeting of Families in, in Dublin, and the Pope is going on August 25th. Mm. The global network of, re of rainbow Catholics were denied a booth, but they are going to have this guy James Martin, who is not openly gay, a Jesuit who wants dialogue on the subject, and, but there are 11,000 right-wingers who have signed a petition against even him speaking. Hmm. And so... There's uh, not enough space for everyone's booths, apparently. Uh, I see. Well, I hope they set up a booth outside. Yeah. Then that would certainly. be good. And okay, let's talk about AIDS news. In AIDS news, uh, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation um, has given uh, $10 million, adding to an existing $2 million, to um, a rent control ballot initiative, Prop 10. That's wild. I think, you know, there, there is a rent control thing there, and uh, the real estate people are obviously fighting it tooth and nail. They've got but a lot for of the money. AIDS Healthcare Foundation to step in with $10 million, wow. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, they do controversial things and they do get involved with these ballot initiatives. And of course, affordable housing is a very big AIDS issue. Of course, yeah. I mean, and they, uh, I don't have the exact details here, but they, they own some affordable housing or they operate some affordable housing um, units themselves. Um, and, you know, housing is obviously um, a, a health a healthcare and uh, uh, queer justice issue. So, I, I mean, it's... It's something to keep an eye on. Um, they they also poured in 2016 um, a lot of money into a drug cap um, and a proposition which right. failed. Um, okay, there's also a lot of controversy about. Are you ready for this? Mm -hmm. I hadn't heard about this. The yeah, molecular neither. surveillance of HIV, uh, which the CDC is scaling up. It means analyzing the genetic sequence of the virus that you get, so that they can identify uh, clusters of transmissions. And it's, it's meant to help tailor HIV care, therapy, and pre uh, prevention. The advocates are worried that it might be misused with all these HIV criminalization laws. The CDC says, don't worry about that, but you never know once it's in the database. And um, they say they're going to protect it. Um, but uh, one of the things that they're finding among these clusters, among MSMs, is that Latinx rates are going up. Uh, mm -hmm. Black rate, 
rates are leveling and white rates continue to decline. All right. Yeah. Entertainment news. Very interesting. Um, so in entertainment news, we've uh, got a uh, Twitter event, uh, Army Hammer of Straight White Men and... Well, let's say what straight white name. men is. This is a play that yeah. Ann and I gave a bad review to, but there That's it true. is. So what happened? Well, uh, someone during Kate Bornstein's opening line. Kate Bornstein opens the show, an out transgender uh, w woman uh, with another transgender actor. They sort of frame the show. Right. Yeah, and there's Kate in the background there with the other, tra I apologize for not having the other transgender. His name there's Army Hammer there, one of the straight white men on the couch. Yes. But what did this audience member do? A compelling do? performance of, um, of sleeping there. Um, Kate, who uses they pronouns, I believe, um, was heckled by an audience member who said, um, I'm paraphrasing, but saying, like, you don't belong here. Um, You're not welcome here. You Kate, Kate had said, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and the rest of us, which is her line, which mm -hmm. she actually uses outside of the show. And, and then this, apparently, this woman, was it a woman? Yes. Uh, with her husband booed throughout the show. Yeah, continued to heckle. No. And Army Hammer posted, um, a, I think this is very interesting, the, the disparate responses to it. Army posted, to the women, to the woman in our audience who felt it was appropriate to yell, you're not welcome here at Cape Bornstein, our beloved friend, coworker, and now family member, dot, 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 feel free uh, never to come back. And Josh Charles, the other, another of the straight white men um, in the performance said, added, um, and also feel free to go, I'm not sure if I can say it. Um, uh, you just say the F word. You would not say, you would not say the whole lady. thing. Um, but, but, and so th that was a pretty, you know, that's a response that is being praised. Army Hammer is a, a, a crusader for LGBT rights, of course. Um, but Kate Bornstein's response I thought was even more interesting. They said, I've been chewing that over, and the best that I can come up with is that one of her children or grandchildren has gone through a gender transition mm. that troubled her greatly, to the point that she just boiled over when I took the stage. Mm. Look, straight white men is a great work of art, and great art does upset people. It happens all the time. Please know that I'm not upset or afraid. I'm more than ever proud to be part of this show. So Kate's response was to to empathize with the you know whatever pain they could imagine that woman that heckler was going through, and then just reaffirm that they were proud of the work that they're doing and and show a strong front to it, which I think is the right, which is a very um, a noble response. Well, it goes back to why are people acting out when they're prejudiced like this? I mean, there's a, there was always a big controversy over the word homophobia or transphobia mm -hmm. or Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. He was good friends with George Weinberg, who coined the term homophobia in the 60s, a non-gay man. Hmm. And I had a, we had discussions about it, because I, I said, it's just anti-gay prejudice. It's not, it's not fear. He said, no, the basis of this action is people are afraid. Yeah. But when, he said, when a dog snarls at you, it's afraid of you. That's what he said. Uh, and uh, so, it, 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 you know, it's an interesting phenomenon. We're trying to get to the root of it. And of course, all of this stuff is coming out more and more these days, people being more and more free to express their prejudice. Right. Have yeah. you run into anything like that? Um, in People on the street, I mean, just feel free to say things to people and uh, attack people and say, you know, and just make comments or th hit them with paintballs. Totally, yeah, in, in I mean, Orlando. I think it's, it's a crucial issue in, in public discourse, whether to um, respond to um, you know, the, this idea of should we respond nonviolently uh, to things with uh, empathy and um, education, outreach, or um, and, and treat aggression as an expression of your own unmet needs, um, or, uh, or respond with pain one, oneself. And, and, you know, I, I think it goes back and forth. Homophobia is interestingly segues us to uh, the next uh, topic. Um, we have a Jack Whitehall, a British comedian, um, who's been cast to play Disney's first uh, gay character um, in a film called Disney's first official gay character. Disney's first official gay character. He. This is a. This is a. a Tumblr slide of him uh, doing a stand-up bit from uh, a, a while ago, saying um, it's not a very good joke. Well, I guess I'm. I guess I'm homophobic um, in the same sense that I'm arachnophobic. Uh, I'm not scared of spiders, um, just like I'm not scared of gay people, but I would scream if, if either showed up in my shower. Oh. Um, which, you That's know. Pretty, uh, I was going to use a handicapist expression, but I'm not going to. It's, it's awful. Uh, but, the, but, the, but the controversy is casting, of course, this gay character is apparently uh, a, ninth, a, a gay man who is hugely effeminate and very campy, and they're having him playing. So Omar Sharif Jr., who's out gay, is criticizing the mouse for casting a non-gay actor playing a, playing a gay stereotype. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, look, you know, Tony Kushner said he was upset when people attacked uh, the idea of Andrew Garfield playing a main gay role and winning the Tony Award in Angels in America. He says, no, I would never ask an actor about their sexual orientation. But I do think that uh, people who have experience bring things to the role that others don't. Right. Although acting should be about anything. But how, where, do you, where do you draw the line on I that? I mean, absolutely. I think in... And uh, Omar Sharif Jr. said it, it well that it's a representation issue and not an acting issue. It's not a question of uh, you know Jack Whitehall's acting ability, although I may uh, hold that in question. Um, it's 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 an issue of uh, availability of parts and the sort of immense impact it could have. A Disney, a company that's gearing its audience toward young people, to have a, an openly gay. Uh, role model playing a gay character and obviously they're just I, I also saw someone say you know we're, if all things were equal um, any actor should play any role all but right. it's not it's not like trans actors are getting um, called into the room to audition for cis roles and likewise well of course Scarlett Johansson was cast in that transgender role and a lot of that is and with Andrew Garfield as well mm -hmm. they're stars right. and they want to sell the movie with a star and you know, uh, we don't have a lot of gay stars, although the entire cast of Boys in the Band is is openly gay. Yeah, it, it's it's a fine line to which walk. Which is unusual. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen it. Um, okay, talk about Batwoman while we have two, we have about three got, minutes left. Yeah, two, two sort of parallel issues here. Batwoman, um, Ruby Rose was announced to play got the lesbian superhero. Yeah, we've got a picture. This is a, a screen grab from uh, Ruby's announcement on Instagram. We also have um, her uh, just very excited and warm, um, uh, effervescent uh, response. So the, tell the me about her. She, the bat. She, the Batwoman's going to be a lesbian, right? So, yes. Yeah, so the, and, the copy from the CW, uh, armed with a passion for social justice and a flair for speaking her own mind, Kate Kane soars onto the streets of Gotham as Batwoman, an out lesbian and highly trained street fighter. And what about the actress, Ruby? Yeah, she's, she's, she's also queer as, as, um, as the day is long <sighs> and right. um, has been for a long time. And she really reacted with umbrage to um, the suggestion that she wasn't a, wasn't lesbian enough um, for the oh, role. Really? Oh, yes. really? Yeah, she, her response was, I mean, the, there were three critiques. Did somebody say that? Three critiques of her uh, casting. One is that she's not a lesbian. One is that she's not Jewish. And one is that she doesn't have the um, acting chops to pull off um, the role well. Um, and she responded to saying, it's just so offensive to me. I've been out forever that, you know, that you would say. And so she has now announced that she's retiring from Twitter. Um, retiring to, from Twitter, but not acting. And no, she's she going to play that role, yeah. She took a lot of abuse on this on Twitter, and she had to close her account. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so where was most of the abuse coming from? From our, from our community? Right. So that's, really? that's the um, that's the sort of the interesting twist to the story. It's um, and and it's it's a, a potent issue of are we uh, too hard on our own? You know, in the oh yes. in the um, in the effort to to see justice uh, in the world. Um, well, we have rules at the at our meetings for reclaiming pride about treating each other with. G gentleness and mm -hmm. not, you know, and not attacking each other, just trying to deal with the issues when we do it. And by the way, we're, we're doing that. Oh, we're, we're out of time? Okay. Yeah, uh, well, thanks for being with us, Rachel. It's been a pleasure, and yeah. It, and, it, and if you want to run the uh, closing of the gay games from Paris, you can do that over the credits. Good night.